Uh, we are picking up at the end of Act 3, <clears throat> the very end. <coughs> so we left off with Hamlet talking to his mother, and he tells her that when she sees Claudius, to let Claudius think or to tell Claudius that he is out of his gourd mad. He hammered. He's just absolutely crazy. Okay? And she says, don't worry, I will. She says, I will, uh, in the breath of life, I have no life to breathe, what thou hast said to me. Meaning, what he has revealed that he knows. For example, that Claudius killed his father. Okay? She, I won't tell him any of that. And Hamlet says, you know I've got to go to England, right? And she says, oh, shoot, I forgot about that. Hamlet, there's letters sealed. And my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust, as I will Adder's Fang, they bear the mandate, they must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. So, letters sealed. He knows that letters have been written and that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern will be carrying those letters to England. And Hamlet says... They bear the mandate. The mandate is whatever is ordered or commanded in those letters. Do we yet, we the audience, have we heard what those letters say? Or do we assume? We're going to find out next act, there's going to be a very short scene where the king is going to tell us what the letters say. We don't know that yet. Okay? All we know is he's going to England to receive the tribute from England. But Hamlet is implying here he knows more than that. That's why he says, there's letters sealed in my two schoolfellows whom I will trust as I will whom I will trust as I will adders fanged. Poisonous snakes, okay? Rattlesnakes like. They bear the mandate. They bear the order regarding me. And that's ostensibly surface level. That is, that I am to receive the tribute from England. England there meaning the king, not the country. Okay? So, they must sweep my way, that is, prepare the way and marshal me to knavery. Why does he say, and marshal me to, to knavery? And what does it mean? The marshal me is, that's a verb. They are setting me up to knavery. I don't mean setting him up, tricking him. I mean, they are like generals marshaling their troops saying, I want you on the left flank, you on the right flank, you're going to go up the center, and we're going to have somebody else come in behind. That's what they're doing. So what does that suggest Hamlet is doing? He's taking their actions, and he's now going to kind of preemptively act. That's what he's implied by the knavery. I am going to have to play the knave, act like a knave. If there's one thing about medieval knightly culture, you don't want applied to you, it's being called a knave. A knave is never understood positively. A knave is someone who always acts uh, duplicitously, who acts underhandedly, who acts dishonorably. Okay? Hamlet is saying, the actions I'm going to take are those of a knave. So, let it work. That is, let it happen. Let it be. You know, channels is a uh, inner poem of Craig. For tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard, and it shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. <clears throat> now, if you look at those four lines that I just read and look at the gloss, the gloss is applying the language about engineer and petar in blowing up. 
not to the situation in this context. The gloss is saying that the engineer is someone militarily who works with explosives. The petar is a packet of explosives used to blow a door open or to blow a hole in a wall that soldiers can then rush into and take. Okay? Literally, that could be what those terms mean. But metaphorically and figuratively, within these lines, it's not at all what they mean. Here, Hamlet is using the engineer to refer to a miner. M-I-N-E-R, not O-R. One who mines. The petard is a pack of explosives used to blow up the ground. For what purpose? To get at the ore, to get the value, valuable stuff inside the ground. And what do you do when you blow up the ground? You blow it to the moon. Big hole, in other words. Okay? So, tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard. We've already talked about, or we did several weeks ago, use of the word sport in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Because Puck says he sees it as a sport, or it is a sport, when lovers fight, he takes their jangling, he says, to be a sport. All that's meant by sport is spectator entertainment. Oh, this is fun watching this. Hamlet's kind of saying it's relatively common practice for people to go watch things being blown up. In the sport part of that, the entertaining part of that, is when somebody accidentally gets blown up in the process. In one sense, we see that same thing happen today. Usually, the only, kind of, the only times that we hear about somebody with explosives getting blown up today is in what context? Terrorist incident. And the terrorist incident is when the terrorist blows up, making the bomb or setting off the bomb. I'm not talking about suicide bombers. That's, that's totally different. Because that's entirely intentional. The sport part, the modern context, is often you'll hear commentators, people writing things, will say, you know, they kind of got what was coming to them. In other words, well, that's one less terrorist in the world to deal with. It becomes a sport, so to speak. Right? It shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. Who's the there? Who are the engineers? It's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Hamlet's suggesting they're involved in the plot. Okay? And so what is what is he saying? So they are planting their explosives, metaphorically speaking. How so? They're the ones bearing the mandate. So what's he going to do? He's going to plant his explosives one yard below theirs. Boom. Blow them to the moon. What has Hamlet just alluded to? They're going to die. They're going to get blown up. They're going to get blown up. Why? kind of goes back to that advice Polonius gave to his son. If you get, stay out of the quarrel, but if you find yourself in it, do what? Bear it such that the others know never to get in that quarrel again. What quarrel is Hamlet in? What's the matter, my lord? Hamlet asked uh, Polonius asks Hamlet about his reading, and Hamlet says, between who? Very presciently. He goes, the word you're reading, oh, that. What's the matter between Hamlet and the king? What are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern doing? They're sticking their nose where it doesn't belong. This is not their quarrel. 
why is Polonius dead? It wasn't his quarrel. He didn't follow his own advice. Remember Polonius's last word, um, last advice to his son? Let me, oh, we'll come to that in a second. So, tis most sweet when in one line two crafts directly meet. Literally, and your gloss kind of, you know, pushes this idea aside. Literally, that means when in one line, one direction, two crafts, two boats intersect. Well, what happens when they intersect? They ram each other. Here, craft, however, can also mean plot. Conspiracy. He says, it is what? It is most sweet when two plots coincide. What are the two plots? Hamlet being taken to England and what Hamlet is going to do essentially to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. So he says, this man shall set me packing. Because he's got to go to England. I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room, mother. Good night. Indeed, this counselor is now this counselor. Okay? A counselor is obviously someone who does what? Counsels, gives words, gives advice. He is now most still, meaning dead, right? Not moving. But what else does that stillness imply? He's not speaking. He's not counseling anymore. He is most secret because counselors need to be able to do what? Keep secrets. I used the, the thing in my first class. There's currently, I think he's in jail already. There's currently a guy in jail who was one of Trump's advisors. Okay? Congress found him um, in contempt of Congress because he wouldn't obey a subpoena. He wouldn't come and testify. He said, I can't testify because I was the president's advisor. I have executive privilege. That is a privilege of having been an advisor to the executive. I don't need to come tell you what we talked about. All right? He's the first person, if I remember correctly, he's the first person to ever go to jail for not testifying about what he told the president. Or for claiming executive privilege and uh, what's the phrase? Disobeying a subpoena. Okay? He's most secret, he, he's kept his secrets to the grave. And most grave, grave there not mean dead, meaning serious. Right? Death, you don't get more serious than death. Who was in life a foolish, prating knave. Why foolish? Fools stick their noses where they don't belong. Fools get involved in other people's business. Prating? Remember when um, Polonius first comes to Gertrude and the king and tells them that Hamlet is crazy? He says, My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time, time. We're nothing but to waste day, night, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. And she's like, more matter, less art. Get to the point. He was prating. He liked to hear his own voice. And he was a knave. He acted duplicitously. That is, put on one face, but acted opposite to that. He pretended to be Hamlet's friend, but didn't really follow through. Why else? The last piece of advice Polonius gave to Laertes was what? And this above all, to thine own self be true, and it follows as the night, the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. What did it mean for to thine own self be true? To, we talked about to follow your own inner moral compass. So how could we say Polonius didn't follow his own inner moral compass? We would have to know what that was. 
How do we know what that was? He just gave all that advice to his son. He didn't follow, apparently, any of it himself. Maybe he didn't dress ostentatiously. So maybe, you know, he dressed appropriately for the occasion. Uh, but the implication is he doesn't listen to his own advice. And this is what happened to him. Act 4. King and Queen come in with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Claudius, there's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. You must translate. Tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? Okay. I misspoke to my earlier class. The sighs and heaves, Gertrude comes in, not out of breath like she's been running. She comes in, <gasps> like she's terrified. He's like, what's wrong? She tells Rosencrantz and Gilmister to leave. What she has to speak is not for their ears, it's only for her husband's. House Hamlet, mad as the sea and wind, when both contend which is the mightier. That is, the sea and wind fighting each other. In his lawless fit, behind the heiress hearing something stir, whips out his rapier and cries, a rat, a rat. And in this brainish apprehension kills the unseen good old man. Okay? In his lawless fit. What fit? Killing Polonius. Why is it lawless? Because it was against law? Could be. That might be a very surface level meaning. How was Hamlet at that point lawless? He was not following his, she's suggesting, own inner moral compass and or reason. Reason is the governor of the body, of the passions of the will. His governor was uncontrolled. It was broken. That's why it's a lawless fit. What does she say he do? He did? He dude? <laughs> he hears a noise behind the heiress and says, a rat, a rat. She doesn't mean Hamlet thought he was killing a rat. We still use that phrase, a rat, to describe what? People who spill the beans. It's often rephrased, you know, today you know, by narc kind of a thing. But a narc is a specific kind of rat, a narcotics officer rat. If you narc on somebody, you're... So, somebody who is going to spill the beans. Well, how did Polonius get the beans, so to speak? He was spying. One of the pieces of advice Polonius gave Laertes Beware entering a quarrel. Okay? Don't get into an argument. Don't get into a quarrel. But if you are, bear it so that the other know not to do that again. <clears throat> Within the play, what is Hamlet's quarrel? Who's his problem with? Claudius. And what have Polonius done? insinuated him into that quarrel. That is, he is between two great ones. What happens when the two great ones, like the two crafts, intersect? Well, whatever's in between them is going to get crushed. And in this brainish apprehension, your gloss tells you brainish, headstrong, passionate, Headstrong could just mean resolved. It's not what it means. Brainish means there's something wrong with his brain. Like he's fevered. He's hallucinating. He's not acting out of his brain. Apprehension, conception, imagination, like when Theseus talks about apprehending ideas and such. He kills the unseen good old man. Within the course of the play, when we see him, how good is Polonius? What does she mean by good old man? 
trusted advisor. That's all she means, okay? Oh, heavy deed. It had been so with us had we been there. And again, every time Claudius or the king says us, he doesn't mean necessarily the two of us or all of us. It's the royal we. And he explains what that means. It had been so with us had we been there. So if it had been me, I'd be the one dead. Notice what Gertrude did not tell Claudius. Hamlet did say, a rat, a rat. And then a couple minutes later, or a few seconds later possibly, is it the king? Because that would be the dead giveaway. His liberty is full of threats to all. To you yourself, to us, that's not to you and me, that's just me, to everyone. In other words, Hamlet's like what? talked earlier in the semester when we were talking about um, Abner Snopes. He's a lone wolf, man. He's ready to snap. Who knows who he's going to kill next? So he says, how shall this bloody deed be answered? Answered. Responded to. Bear in mind, Germanic societies are feudal societies, okay? This is a different, no, take the back. Scratch that, I'm not even gonna bring that up. Germanic societies, ancient Denmark, ancient Norway, ancient Sweden, Anglo-Saxon England, both before and after they become Christianized, for a little while at least, revolve around the moral code, the ultimate moral code is the feud. And all the feud means is, if I harm a member of your family, you are morally obligated to harm me or a member of my family. If I kill a member of your family, you are morally obligated, and in some instances in these countries, Anglo-Saxon and England had this law, for example, you are legally obligated to kill me. That kind of revenge was not against the law in the earliest Anglo-Saxon laws, right? You could go to court, you could demand payment for your dead relative, or you could just as easily go kill the person who did the killing, okay? Where does that end? It doesn't. Look at modern day Israel and the Palestinian slash Arab problem. That didn't begin 50 years ago with the Yom Kippur War in 1973, or in the Six Day War of 67, or in the Independence War in 48 when Israel got its independence. It began when? The book of Genesis, when Abraham, Abraham has two sons by two different wives. One his real wife, one his wife's handmaiden, Ishmael versus Isaac. That's where that problem begins. Okay? In this idea of the feud, it, it doesn't end. It's not like you killed my son, I killed you, even Stephen. Because once I kill you, now your son is going to come after me. And if I have any other sons left there, it's just tit for tat. How is this going to be answered? The play is a revenge tragedy, right? The ghost has told Hamlet, avenge my death. Hamlet has now killed Polonius. It's a revenge tragedy. It's not only Hamlet's. So what is going to happen? Laertes now has to avenge his father's death, or possibly uh, Ophelia avenge it. How will it be answered? He says, it will be laid to us. And when, he, when he's asking the answer, notice you don't have a gloss there. It should, to help explain the part following. Because the word answer is implying that revenge mentality. But the rest of the answer is talking about what will the people out there say? Right? Because nobody outside the palace 
knows that Polonius is dead. But as with all news, it will trickle out. And he says, it will be laid to us. We will be blamed for the death of Polonius. Why? Because us, whose providence should have kept short, restrained, and out of haunt, this mad young man. We had the ability to do what? Lock Hamlet up when we thought he was crazy. But we didn't. Why? So much was our love, we would not understand what was most fit. I so loved Hamlet, I didn't know what should be done is what he's suggesting. Question, true or false? Does Claudius really love Hamlet? Like he says he does. We'll just let that hang. But like the owner of, uh, um, no, I've skipped the rest of that. So he asked Gertrude, where is Hamlet? To draw apart the body he has killed over whom his very madness, like some ore among a mineral metal base, shows itself pure. Notice, he's crazy, he killed Polonius, but she says, the act Hamlet has done, okay, of drawing apart the body, meaning taking care of the body, shows what on Hamlet's part? It shows he's not totally gone. Why? Because the act is like ore the valuable stuff in the mine. She's going back to the mining metaphor that Hamlet used just previously. There's still, to use popular film reference, there's still some good in Hamlet, okay? Oh, Gertrude, come away. We have to leave, we have to get away. And Hamlet's going to be on that boat, he says before, the sunrise hits the mountains. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. King says, go find Hamlet, bring him here. Okay. Scene two, Hamlet comes in. He tells the audience, safely stowed, that is, I've taken care of Polonius' body. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Where, where's the dead body? What have you done with it? Compounded it with dust where to tis kin. Why does he call Polonius' body kin with dust? Genesis. Because from dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. It's part of, part of God's curse to Adam. All right? Sounds like he's buried him. Tell us where he is so we can take him to the chapel. Why are they going to take him to the chapel? Polonius is going to receive a Christian burial. The body is going to go to the chapel because they don't have morgues in this time period. Go to the chapel to be cleaned and washed and properly attired for a funeral service. Hamlet, don't believe it. Uh, believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. We got a gloss down there. Keep your counsel. Hamlet is aware of their treachery but, treachery, but says nothing about it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel, your secrets, and not mine own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge. Okay, what are his secrets? Where the body is. What are their secrets? Hamlet's implying they know what Claudius is going to tell us shortly that they're taking Hamlet to his death, okay? Why does he call him a sponge? Rosencrantz, taking me for a sponge, my lord? Remember Hamlet's first conversation with Polonius. Do you know me, my lord? I very well, you are a fishmonger. Not me. Now he's called Rosencrantz a sponge. How's he a sponge? Notice there's method, same language Polonius used, there's method in this madness. Here's how you're a sponge. I, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. Now, your gloss there, say, there says authoritative backing. 
He has your support. So, you're like a sponge in that you soak up the king's countenance. Well, there's only one way Rosencrantz and Guildenstern can soak up, receive the king's countenance. And that's to be in the presence of the king a lot. Kind of like circling him, you know, like a shark circling a seal. Okay? Soaking up his countenance, soaking up his rewards, meaning payments, and soaking up his authorities. Hamlet told his mother that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern bear what to the king of England? The mandate. See, I don't think authorities necessarily means only his authoritative backing. It means his um, dispensations, his decrees. Okay? He's telling them he trusts them like he would Adder's bank. But such officers, like you guys, do the king best service in the end. What does in the end mean? Hamlet's going to start almost harping on this notion. Death. They do the king's best job in their deaths. He keeps them, like an ape and apple, in the corner of his jaw. The ape keeps the apple there while it goes about and does its other business. Notice what the apple cannot do. It can't leave, it can't escape, it's always there. First mouthed, that is to be played with in the mouth, to be last swallowed. When he needs what you have gleaned, he who, the king, when he needs what you have gleaned, what information you've gotten from me, it is but squeezing you. Remember Hamlet used the image of wringing his mother's heart to do what? To get the foulness out. It is but squeezing you and sponge. <laughs> you will be dry again. Only thing is, when do we wring sponges? When do we use sponges? Where do sponges grow? the ocean. What, what, we, what must we do, real sponges, not the artificially ones, what must sponges do or what must happen to them before we can use them? They're killed. See, if you use a real sponge that's come from the ocean, it's dead when you're using it. Hamlet's telling them, you guys are damn fools. Why? They didn't hear Polonius's advice. Don't enter into a quarrel. Just like Polonius got between a rock, Claudius, and a hard place, Hamlet, these two will also. They are collateral damage in the great war, the cold war, so to speak, between Claudius and Hamlet. What do you mean? I understand you not. I'm glad. <laughs> a neighbor's speech sleeps in a foolish ear. And he's suggesting here, eh, it's okay, it's just a stupid speech. It doesn't make any sense anyways. Or it's a duplicitous speech, meaning it's got two meanings. And you're stupid and you don't understand it. Where's the body? The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. You've got a gloss. There are many interpretations. Possibly, the body lies in death with the king, my father, but my father walks disembodied. That is, the king is not with the body. Or, Claudius says the bodily possession of kingship, the kingliness or justice of inheritance, is not with him. <coughs> Shakespeare is alluding to the political theory prevalent in his day, of the king's two body, two bodies, or the two bodies of the king. The king obviously has a physical body. That's one of those bodies. 
The other one is the what's called the body politic, the state. We saw this idea, it's not original to the Elizabethans. We saw this idea all the way back with Sophocles. In the first play, Oedipus the King, Sophoc um, Oedipus is speaking with Creon. It's after he's already accused Creon of conspiring against him. And Creon says, you know, you'd be a great king of an island with only one person. And Oedipus says, the city is the king. Meaning, what happens to the city happens to me. I am the city. All right? Queen Elizabeth would refer to herself as England. And this is why you use the metaphor of England, the king, to also refer to the entire state. Norway, Denmark, etc. Okay? So, the body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. That could also mean the body is with the king, that is, the body politics. Denmark is with the king. It's, it's supporting him, but the king is not with the body. That is, the king is not in accord with the body. Why so? Because Claudius isn't the rightful king. And in that sense, Claudius is against the body. If Claudius were really with the body, he would step aside and let Hamlet take his rightful place. That's the thing about the inheritance. Okay? The king is a thing, my lord, of nothing. In Shakespeare's day, the word nothing, spelled this way, was pronounced like this, noting So the word, this, had two meanings. No thing, obviously, and no king to mark, to look at, to pay attention to, to examine. The king is a king, the king is a thing of, which is it? Nothing or noting, paying attention to, keeping an eye on. Bring me to him. All right? King comes in. New scene. Says, I've sent for him. Brother Grants and Gilda's turn come in. What's happened? We don't know where he put the body. We can't get from him. But where's he's outside. Don't, he sent Rosencrantz and Gilda's turn to bring Hamlet in. He's not with them. He's like, uh, is he wandering around? Is he going to stab me in the back? So, He's outside, he's under armed guard, everything's... Bring him in. Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. At supper? Where? Now, the king's at supper with an exclamation mark. Exclamation mark. May suggest that possibly he's like, not dead. Is it possible? Not likely, but could be. Where? Not where he eats, but where is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are even at him. That E hyphen, uh, apostrophe E N, it's just an abbreviation for even. Pronounced as one word, E N. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king, your lean beggars, but variable service, two dishes. But to one table, that's the end. Okay. What the hell is Hamlet talking about? Because I don't think the king has a clue. At supper where? Where is he eating? Oh, no, no. He's not eating. He is eaten. Where ah is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are even at him. Everybody, every edition of this play has a footnote like the one down here. This is an allusion to the Dean of Worms, which happened in 1521. Okay, notice the pronunciation. Diet. A diet is a meeting. It's a convocation. MTSU has every fall 
fall convocation. The vocation part comes from Latin vocare, which means to call. The con comes from co, which means together. It's a calling together of all the people of the university. So this is a calling together of politic worms, Hamlet is suggesting. Why politic worms? Why not dirty worms? Why not grubby worms? Why not meal? What's politics? Literally the word politic refers to power relations among human beings. The polis is the city where people inhabit and they have power relations among them. Some polises were set up, you know, where everybody has equal power and stuff. That's where we get political ideas, communism, Marxism, you know, democracy, etc. Okay? So these worms are politically eating in, meaning they're sharing. Okay? The diet of worms, diet, convocation, this is a place in Germany. It's a town name. This diet was a convocation, a meeting called for by a word that Hamlet's going to use in just a moment, the Holy Roman Emperor. It was called for a very specific purpose. 1521, it was called for Martin Luther to finally be able to come have his debate about the 95 Theses. Remember I mentioned the other day, he nailed 95 arguments on the church door in Wittenberg, October 31st, 1517, about points of disputation he wanted to argue about the church. Nobody took him up on it. So he started writing about these. He wrote books, he wrote pamphlets, he wrote articles, etc. Because the printing press had been invented, they could spread far and wide over Germany. Four years later, Holy Roman Emperor invites him to a meeting, you get to have your debate. Luther's like, finally. He's granted what's called safe passage, which means you will arrive safely, nobody's gonna kidnap you and you know disappear you, and you will leave safely and get home. It's almost like I will send an armed guard to protect you. Cool. Luther gets there and he thinks, I'm finally going to get to have the, the argument I want to have. He gets there. In the morning of the diet occurring, there's a table. And on that table are written copies, are printed copies, of everything he's written over the last four years. Everything. Here's the debate he's given. See, in a formal debate, the debate is centered around a premise. We're going to debate, you know, the premise. <sighs> Only white males should be allowed to vote. Go back to the founders kind of a thing. So, you have pro and con sides. Obviously, the premise are these 95 theses. Luther's going to argue the pro or whatever, and somebody else. He gets there, there's all this stuff. The debate is, take it all back. That's it. Recant. Not really a debate. Luther says, give me 24 hours to pray. He prays back the next day and says, unless it can be shown or proven to me by reason, by conscience, or holy scripture, I stand by every word I've said, every word I've written. I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> he leaves and gets kidnapped by his friends. They take him to Wittenberg Castle where he starts translating the Bible into German. It's the first time the Bible really gets translated into what's called the vernacular language, a common language of the people. Remember I had written up here the other day the Protestant motto, sola scriptura, sola fides, sola gratia. Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. He wanted to put the Bible in common German's hand so that they could read it, talk to God, and find their way. All right? Back here. Your worm is your only emperor for what? Diet or diet? Because diet means meeting. Diet means what you eat. And then he explains. Colon. What comes after is an explanation of what came before. 
We fed all creatures else to fat us. And we fat ourselves for maggots. Okay? Assuming you're not vegan, he's saying, we fatten cows, we fatten pigs, we fatten sheep. For what purpose? To feed us. In other words, the purpose of those animals is our, cul our culinary delight. Our gastronomic delight. Okay? Why do we fatten ourselves? Why do we eat? For the delight of maggots. Hamlet, in this speech, is he mad? Is he feigning madness? Whichever. Hamlet is saying the human, the purpose of human existence is to do what? It's the circle of life, and cue the Lion King music. From dust to dust, and to feed worms. That's it. Your fat king, and I kind of think he points to Claudius, your fat king and your lean beggar, what variable service? Variable service just means two different kinds of food on a table, right? Thanksgiving dinner, big whole, you know, thing, eh, bread and water for like somebody in prison. They both do the same thing. There are two dishes, but to one table. That's the end. The table is death. You eat to live. You eat. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, resolve itself into a dew, or that the cannon had, the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self slaughter. Hamlet, from his opening, is thinking about death. Alas, alas. Why does Claudius say that? He thinks Hamlet has, is just. Absolutely, totally gone. In other words, there's not that little shining glimmer of good still in him that Gertrude suggested. Hamlet, he's not done yet. So he said, we fatten ourselves for what? For the maggots, for the worms. He's going to pull along that on it. Pull along that thread. The man may fish with the worm, let it eat of a king, and eat of the fish, let it fed of that worm. Okay? King dies, king gets buried. Worm burrows through the ground, eats of the corpse of the king, that is, takes part of the king into itself. A man catches that worm, puts it on a hook as bait, catches a fish, the fish eats the worm, the man eats the fish. Therefore, the man eats the king that the worm ate. What do you mean, Hamlet? Nothing but to show you how a king may go of progress through the guts of a beggar. In other words, nothing to show you but how a king may be a piece of shit. That's what he means. Sorry for the language. It's exactly what he means. What's he saying? You piece of Where's Polonius? Why does the king respond that way? Ooh, he's mad now. He gets that. He doesn't understand the convocation of worms part. This part, he understands clearly. In heaven, well, that's pretty generous and charitable of Hamlet. Polonius was killed by him, and he goes to heaven. Send thither to see. What does send thither mean? Go pick somebody else and kill that person so they can go find him. If your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. Go to hell. But if you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs towards the lobby. Why as you nose him? Or you shall nose him. You're going to smell them before you even get to them. 
How long has Polonius been dead? We don't know. Seemingly, it's only a few minutes. It's not been more than an hour. Bodies, they do start to compose, uh, decompose, not compose, decompose, but they don't start to smell that quickly. Give them four or five hours and they will start to. Okay? He sends attendants. Hamlet, yeah, I'll stay here. Um, Hamlet, for your safety, we gotta send you to England immediately. Yay! For England! Notice you don't have the yay, but you get the for England exclamation. Like road trip. I Hamlet could. So as if you knew our purposes. Hamlet, I see a cherub that sees them. Your gloss. Cherub, angels of knowledge. They're not just angels of knowledge. They're angels who are privy to, as much as they can understand, the mind of God. Hamlet's going, oh, <laughs> I know what your purpose is. But come, England. Farewell, dear mother. Where is Gertrude? She's not in this scene. So as he kind of looked at the door, bye, mother. No. When he says farewell, dear mother, he's looking Claudius in the eyes. Thy loving father, Hamlet. Why does he say that? <whistles> Hamlet, you, I'm right here. Like, are you so far gone? Hamlet, my mother. Father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh. And so, therefore, ergo, my mother. Logically perfect. Come, England. Follow him at foot, that is, stay close. Get him on that ship. Everybody leaves, and what does Claudius admit to us? Do you remember when the ghost told Hamlet, the serpent that stung me now wears the crown? And Hamlet replies, oh, my prophetic soul. Did he know that Claudius killed his father? No. But he's, he thinks there's something. When Hamlet tells his mother he will trust his friends as fetters ang, fang, he knows something's wrong. He doesn't know the specifics. Okay? Now we hear the specifics. The letters they are bearing tell England, the king, kill Hamlet. And he says, till I know it's done, however my haps, that is, whatever fortune I receive, my joys were ne'er begun. Until I know, that is, until I receive word back from England, Hamlet is dead, he says, um, I will have no joy. All right? Scene four. We've got four minutes. A plane in Denmark. Why? Hamlet is being marched somewhere to a port where they can board the ship. And we see young Fortinbras. This is young Fortinbras of Norway. This is the nephew of the current king of Norway. The son of the dead king of Norway. Who tells his captain, go greet the Danish king. For what purpose? He wants safe passage. That is, we're not here to invade Denmark. See, Norway comes down like this. Sweden's over here. Norway comes down like this. Denmark sticks up off the north coast of England. Germany, Poland. He's got to get to Poland, but he's got to go through Denmark and Germany to do so. He's saying, I'm not going to harm you, Denmark. I just want to go through. Captain says, I'll do it. Okay. Fort and Braga goes on the captain's left. Hamlet comes in. With the others, by the way, they're not mentioned, but Hamlet is kind of like, leading the march to the ship. <clears throat> and uh, they are there, sorry, mentioned right there. And Hamlet asks the king, whose men are these? Norway. Why? Why does Hamlet ask? How purpose? He's thinking as a good 
patriotic gain. Why are these men marching on my kingdom? Uh, they're marching to Poland. Oh, okay, that's fine. Who commands them? Nephew to old Norway, Fort Bra. Uh, is he leading a battle against all of them? Is he going to try and conquer Poland? No, just a little patch. We go to gain a little patch of ground that has in it no profit but the name to pay five ducats. That is, we go to take control of a little piece of ground worth only five ducats. So imagine this whole room is Poland. These two tiles is what Fort Brat is going to fight for. Hamlet. The Polak will never defend it. I mean, why? Denmark. Uh, the captain. It's already garrisoned. It's already defended. 2,000 souls and 20,000 ducats will not debate the question of the straw. However much money and however much men, he says, will not do what? Debate the question of the straw. Line 26, settle this trifling matter. Why is it a trifle? Hamlet is saying, this little spot of ground isn't worth 2,000 souls. Why would men die for this? Why would men fight for this? Okay. We'll pick up there, line 25, on uh, Friday. And I don't know that we'll finish at 4. Probably will. We'll get through quite a bit. All right. Have a good rest of the day. Wake up.